Welcome to our Coaches Kitchen Table Discussion Series, where you join myself and the top coaches and influencers in the sport community, where we talk about a variety of topics related to coaching, athlete development, and so on. In this episode, part one of two, we welcome three legendary youth sport head coaches from McMaster University men's team, Dave Preston, University of British Columbia women's volleyball team, Doug Reimer, and retired Queen's University men's team, Brenda Willis. The three coaches will discuss the process of recruiting athletes, what they look for, and scholarship opportunities athletes should take advantage of. Welcome everybody uh, to our fifth uh, session of on my at my kitchen table talking volleyball with uh, the experts from around Canada. Uh, today we're looking at demystifying post-secondary education and post-secondary uh, volleyball programs. Um, trying to bring on the top people that know the most about post-secondary volleyball programs and uh, get them to give us some insights and some tips and some tricks and some things that would help us as coaches and also as athletes uh, try to achieve our goal of playing at that next level. So using uh, our club season to move to the next level uh, and how can we do that? So uh, I want to welcome, first of all, three of the top coaches uh, in university, uh, U-Sport, CIS, and uh, can I even say the one before that? What was that one before CIS was? Um, CIAU. CIAU, that's right. So all three of them, you've gone through all three phases and uh, so thank you, uh, Dave Preston from McMaster University, uh, Doug Reimer from UBC, and Brenda Willis uh, from Queen's University. I really appreciate you guys coming on and uh, lending your expertise to us all. Uh, what we want to do first is we'll take a quick, um, have both Doug and Dave talk about their programs in terms of what their process is in recruiting. So when do they start their, their thought process? How do they determine what they need to recruit? all those types of things that go on in behind the scenes that we don't know about, uh, get their insight into that. So uh, Doug, why don't we start with you uh, and maybe give us uh, just a quick idea of what's going on. Sure, thanks very much. And um, I'll, I'll be brief to start with because I think we can dial into this in a lot more detail. Um, you know, I don't think there's any one exact path. Um, so for the coaches, listening if you're talking to your athletes it doesn't hurt to reach out early it can be too early like we've had athletes you know sort of in grade eight and you're just like okay we're not we're not ready for that can you get back to us in a couple of year couple of years so um i'd say there's several paths one is we're going to hear about some of the best players and we're going to research that right so if uh players on a uh, provincial team that you know especially if it's in the province that you live or youth or junior national team you're going to know every good university coach is going to going to figure that piece out so if you're not in that and you've decided you want a certain university you need to reach out um, to that and I think you know we can talk about we can talk about that in more detail um, in terms of just from coach's point of view, you're looking at it from a number of different points of view, but you're really looking at going a couple of years ahead. Where are we graduating? How many are we graduating and in what positions? And um, that's the starting point that we'll sit down with our coaching staff and take a look at. And that'll determine a little bit how, you know, where we're starting our process. So I'll just uh, leave it there for the first minute and uh, turn it over to Dave. Thanks, Doug. Uh, thanks, Colin, for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity and I hope everybody is safe and healthy. Um, recruiting is probably a little bit different now than it used to be 20 years ago. Um, with the just the sheer number of athletes that are looking to play now, um, the number of programs that are that are actively recruiting more and the number of opportunities that there are to play. So I think the the recruiting um, process has evolved just like the sport is. Uh, for me, it's very, very specific. Um, I, you know, we only bring in three to four athletes a year. Uh, so it's not like we recruit on mass. Um, 
Sometimes the classes get a little bit bigger than that, but as Doug mentioned, you kind of forecast out. So you can kind of have a little, uh, you know, a little bit of succession planning in your, in your turnover. So you're not graduating seven at once. At least that is for me. Um, but the other thing, Colin, is that uh, the, the top end of our roster, say the players from one to nine, one to 10, they usually stay for four to five years. Um, depending on their degree and and uh, and and how their academic load is structured out of that, um, but the the bottom end of our roster from 11 to and I'd like to only care I'd, if I could I'd only carry 16, um, but because of the nature of our environment, I usually end up carrying 18. And so from 11 to 18, it usually turns over every two to three years. I think the the athletes realize that the investment is significant. Um, life starts to become a little bit more important than volleyball or academics take uh, the forefront. A number of reasons on an individual uh, ind individual's scenario that, that would mandate it. But uh, I, I'd say for the, you know, for the top end of the roster, they stay for a, a longer period of time than the bottom one. So again, all those factors kind of, you know, uh, influence the recruiting process, but um, it, it, it's becoming a much, much more competitive uh, environment and I think our friends down south are making it even more competitive where they're going at it at an earlier age which is forcing families to make those educated decisions earlier gather information earlier um, so all those things are starting to to really factor into the uh, to the recruiting science so it sounds like uh, so when I what I picture is um, a big you got a big one wall in your office is just full of all your athletes got years beside them, you've got uh, how, what do I need in nine, in two thousand twenty four two thousand twenty five, um, and it's just you it, you just stare at that wall every morning for half an hour to forty five minutes and say okay what what am I looking at what do I got to do like it sounds like you guys have a you have to be thinking about it all the time. You can't just be uh, waiting until provincials or nationals. Uh, you've got to be thinking all the time. You've got to be thinking more than one year at a time as well. You've got to be thinking long term. It sounds like it, it, it's a, it takes up a lot of your day. Does that, does that make sense or is that correct? Um, yeah, you know, I, I'll jump in here, Doug, before you, before you go. I wouldn't say I, I'm, I'm every day consumed by it. Uh, I think there's big picture overarching stuff. Um, I'm much more consumed with the ones I have in my gym than the ones I don't. Uh, so I, I need to make sure I take care in, you know, in, in my mind, recruit, retain, re develop, right? There's three aspects to it. So I can get them there, but if I don't do anything with them or keep them there, then it's just recruit, recruit, recruit. And that's just way too much work. So, uh, I, I think there's a, a process to it, uh, where you recruit, the best fit. Um, and, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but then you got to keep them there. So you got to make them academically successful uh, and, and then develop them. So they're volleyball successful. So I think there's a little bit more to it than just staring at a whiteboard full of initials. Glad Dave said that because I was going to jump in the same. If you look at the length of our U sports schedule, most years, you know, like we're starting right about now and um, national championships are in mid-March and it's in some ways too long, but it prevents doing as much active recruiting and, you know, you just, frankly, you want to work. We don't, I think the majority of U-sport coaches didn't get into it to recruit and be really great recruiters. They they want to coach. So in some ways it's a necessary evil. I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy meeting parents and kids and talking to, to coaches, but I don't want to spend in any way, shape or form too much time doing it. And, um, cause I want to train, train my players and, you know, take it from there. So I think I agree with Dave. I mean, obviously different coaches are going to have different approaches, you know, and that's, that's something for, you know, people to be aware of too. There's probably a range, fairly big range. Um, Dave made a couple of excellent uh, points. I thought early on too, um, just in terms of roster management and the changes that can happen there. And just to put a little different, we've actually had players, some of our top end players, leave to go play pro, like national team 
level players. So um, that is something that has only happened in the last few years, never, ever happened before. Um, the other thing that we've faced in a number of other programs that can change things fairly quickly, can change your planning, is just injuries, you know. So, for example, in our program, four ACL injuries um, and way more athletes actually coming into our program that are injured. So it's not just that they're injured in their last year. They're injured uh, almost from the get-go. And so that forces what Dave was talking about to maybe taking a slightly expanded roster. Um, so again, these are individual. Um, so both you guys have had, and, and Brenda, you as well, have had successful programs. Well, how does it work for... Um, and you may not know this, but I'm just curious for those programs that are not at the top of the pack where they are looking at those blue chippers and, and things like that, like how do they, um, how do they recruit or is it any different than what you guys have to do or your thought process as well? Like, I mean, those schools that are, you know, you're looking at schools that are far out or smaller schools, do they have much different scenarios than you guys have in terms of recruiting? or planning their recruiting? Well, I can't speak on their behalf, Colin, at all, but I do know that the, the competitiveness of recruiting right now is probably, in my 28-year career, uh, it's as competitive as it's ever been. Um, and I think what, uh, regardless of the size of the program, I think every coach knows um, what they have to offer and what they're looking for. And I think that's what I talked before about the fit. Uh, so some schools have a tremendous amount of scholarship money um, that they may be able to offer and, and they use that for attraction. Other ones have tremendous academic programs um, or um, very tailored uh, uh, academic programs. So I think it's really important that the coach knows, and I think every coach does, um, what their, what their uh, enhancements are, what, what, what makes my program different than the others. And then I think it's really important that you seek out the athletes that fit that. Um, so I, I don't like to cast a net and go down a list of, of okay, I, I need a left side and here's the, the nine best in the country. Um, I, I have a saying, you know, when I'm recruiting is that uh, talent will get you noticed, but character will get you recruited. And so I'm looking for, yes, a level of talent. Um, I know the level that we want to play at. But the difference makers for me are the characters, the academics, that kind of stuff. So I would love a gym full of talent. I think that would be great. Um, but I know that that may not, may not work at McMaster. I know what my fit is. It's a high academic school. And I know that the bandwidth of athlete that I want to work with and the ones that are capable of studying at that level is going to be pretty slim. So I have to, I have to do my work on the front end um, rather on the back. The other thing in, re in recruiting is you recruit your own problems. Right. So if I recruit somebody who's going to be marginal in terms of uh, getting them in, uh, you know, right on the academic threshold, then I know that I'm going to have a lot of work to do to keep them on that and, and really, you know, babysit that academic side of things. Um, or I can go the other way and make sure I do my homework and know that these academic all Canadians are going to be fine. I don't have to worry about that, but perhaps that's on the development side of things. So, you know, I, I think there's uh, I think it's got to be a fit. So I don't know if the smaller schools recruit differently than the big schools or the rich schools recruit you know, uh, differently than the, the schools who don't have as much scholarship money. I just think it's really important that each coach recruits the way it fits. I can maybe add, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing. Um, I do know that there are a few coaches uh, in the OUA, certainly, who, who recognize that those blue chippers are not likely to come to their school because they want to play for a top team. And they tend to visit the championship level of tournaments as opposed to the premier level of tournaments um, because there are some, quote, blue chip potential, you know, one on a team that doesn't have a lot of talent. And if they can secure one from here and one from there, it can really up their program. Um, and they think they have a better crack at those people. So that's about the only thing I would add that's a bit different perhaps than uh, Dave, Doug, or I would, would normally target. Doug, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, it's different out West too, so. Oh, we're not that different. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, just mainly echoing the comments, like, I guess recruiting, I'll echo Dave's thing just generally, like recruiting is, I'd say it's getting harder, not easier. Um, that's the competition points that he made earlier. I would say just way better quality of coaching across the country and way more competition or the competition still stays there south of the border. Um, and the other thing from a university coach point of view that really complicates it is that it is so much easier now to just for any athlete just to fire out info and fire it out a lot. So you're inundated with, you know, information and I can't really tell right away an athlete from Ontario, maybe how good they are. So it's going to take some work and research to figure, to figure that, to figure that out. Um, and so, you know, and because athletes are looking probably for answers more quickly and, you know, uh, you know, just that connection a lot, I'd say the pressures on post-secondary coaches have, have grown a fair bit and probably at bigger schools that may be more the case. I'm, you know, I'm not sure, but I just know my inbox is fairly full with athletes and often you aren't even sure exactly how widely they're spreading, you know, how, how many schools they're actually targeting. Um, so that, you know, it can complicate things as well. I'll pause. No, that's good information. It's, uh, it, I mean, one of the things that I've learned this year uh, with the 18U girls is that there's more opportunity. Like the, you, you, when you're in Ontario, you think of Ontario, and then you might think out west. But now uh, we have to think out east as well. And, and so we have a couple girls going out east, and that's – spreading their opportunities out for female athletes anyways uh, on the male side <clears throat> pretty much out east you're going to have to be either french or uh, you have dal or new brunswick still but um it's it's interesting like you said it's it's now i can connect with every one of those coaches from bc all the way to newfoundland because of technology so it makes that's one thing athletes need i think take into consideration is that they are able to communicate with a lot but just because more doesn't make it better uh it doesn't give you more chances as well right i mean uh i think what you guys are all saying it has to be a fit and i think when we get with, with brenda at the end when we really talk about <clears throat> athletes really making good choices on how to make the find the right fit is going to be important um what i want to do is move to the next question now and you guys have sort of started to answer it and i'll um I'll put both questions together. So my question is, what do you look for in an athlete? And you guys have sort of generally said it, but maybe even give us some specifics uh, if some scenarios or uh, situations you've come, you've been in where you were looking for a specific thing. Uh, and then the big one, I think, for athletes and coaches is how do you determine these characteristics in the athletes? So, well, Doug, you said you got to do your research, your homework. What does that entail? What does that mean? What does it look like? Uh, for you guys to do that so that you do your, your due diligence to make sure the fit is right on your end as well. And Dave, uh, sorry, Doug, you're up. your face is up first on the video screen, so why don't you go first? Okay. Um, you know, some of that hasn't changed very much in the 30 years I've been doing this, uh, plus years. Um, because as Dave said, you need talent, you're going to need some talent in the gym. And so maybe in each province, there's a few athletes that you're going to see at the provincial club championship that every post-secondary coach or any coach on this call would go, yeah, kind of want that individual, right? But that number is not very big um, in any year. Um, and for probably each level of university, what, Brenda was getting at is accurate. You know, they may target, um, they may target a certain level, but just speaking for our program, we want to be competitive with the best teams in the country. We want to try and attract the, the best athletes. So that's one category of athlete. We are going to explore um, that and then dial into the academic component because at UBC, it is not easy. You know, it's a strong academic school. So Dave's comments, there we're bang we're bang on in that regard because that would be how i would start any conversations there's no sense going down a path if this athlete isn't going to be able to cut it 
um, academic, academically. It is not in their interest either to try and do it, not just in terms of recruiting, what was your line, Dave? Recruiting your problems, um, something like that. So, um, so we're gonna look academics and that's kind of a bit the first stage. And we're matching that up with what do we actually need in our, in our roster. So that's one category, let's call it blue chip. So we're gonna go that direction, but that's not, we're not gonna fill our roster that way. So then we've got athletes that have contacted us or we've looked and gone, well, you know, might be a little bit undersized to do it. Arm swing isn't great, but got these other characteristics. And that's where I really, I think you gotta dial in on where are they going to, can they make those contributions? Is this going to be a good fit? I know that's an overused term, but it is still the best one I'd come to. In other words, within the roster that we've got and what we do, can this player be, you know, contribute? I will say that over time, I, because I've been humbled by making incorrect decisions or incorrect predictions about where athletes have gone, I offer less and less promises about where an athlete is gonna end up once I get past maybe that real, you know, potential superstar stud. And even there sometimes, the best player in that province cannot make a transition well to university life. There is some aspect that has been, a, has been a block. And I quote those examples to parents and to athletes when I do talk to them in both directions. In other words, even if they're a strong athlete, I'll go, listen, I'm not going to, you know, I don't go down that route about playing time, et cetera, because there's just so many different ways that this could go awry. And I have images of athletes that have, vastly overachieved during their time at our program and athletes that never achieved the potential that every one of their coaches or even I thought they would achieve in university. So it is by no means <laughs> any way an exact science or anywhere close to it. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Uh, and then I'll get to your next part. Yeah, when, when the best in the country speaks at it, you just concur. Um, I, I'm, in, I'm in the same boat. Uh, the amount of blue chips that are available that every program is going after is becoming less and less. Um, and unfortunately, there's other leagues um, that influence this too, right? Like the NCAA or direct national team. Uh, so there, there's other components to, you know, the better athletes get, sometimes the 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 less access there is. So um, I think getting the right fit to that, I call them baby blues, right? You got your blue chips and, and then you have your baby blues. Um, and so in those baby blues, uh, where, where are they? How do they fit with what we currently have? How can I make that work? And quite honestly, that's why I end up carrying 18 is because you're trying to put together a puzzle and along with development, those puzzle pieces are changing. And so you're trying to forecast a year out of, I think this person can get to this level and therefore I'm going to need somebody to fill in this. And then whether they do or don't changes what actually needs to be recruited. So um, I, I, I like Doug, I make no promises. Um, I think the student athlete has a lot more to do with what their success and playing time is going to uh, be determined than me. Um, I like, uh, I like the, I, I think it's really important that the student athletes I'm talking to understand what our culture is and how they can influence their own playing time and what opportunities they're going to have to do that and who they're going to have to do that with every day. And so I think that's probably pretty important because some athletes I talk to, there's a couple of schools of thought here. Some athletes I talk to don't want to compete for a spot every day. They need the security of knowing that that's my spot. I, I, I'm, the, I'm the P2, I'm the M1, I'm the starter, and they need that security. Um, and then there's others who are like, well, I'll fight for it every day. I'm good with this. I know this is going to make me better. This is my personality. And so it's up to me to do my homework on the front end to make sure that the athletes who we're getting understand what the culture of our gym is going to be like and which of those two environments they fit best in. Um, and then I think the other determining factor is the ones that are I, – I, I've noticed – that either club directors or coaches 
are, are starting to provide templates uh, to students who are reaching out because I can almost tell now that the template is coming from a certain area um, and, it, and, and they're good and they provide all the right information. Um, the ones I'm not enamored with tremendously are the ones that start off with how much money can I get for a scholarship. So those ones usually work to their way to the bottom of the pile quicker than the other ones do. Um, I don't like people saying, what, what can you do for me right off the hop? Um, I want to get to know the person and then we can determine what kind of support we can invest in their development from a tuition point of view or that kind of stuff. So I come from a school, a coach at a school that doesn't have a tremendous amount of scholarship money. So those conversations right off the bat turn me off a little bit because we have to make the best of what we have if we don't always have the best. And so um, I think right now the, the, the money conversation is important they are to a family as important they are to a recruit, if they're leading the conversation, sometimes it's a little bit of a flag for me. So um, the ones that have to have the security and I need my spot and I have to have a full scholarship, and uh, those are the ones that uh, often I'll continue to look. Yeah, I, I would often flip the conversation when they said, <clears throat> um, where do you see me fitting in what I start? And I, and I would say, well, you know, your development will determine whether you start, but I'm going to ask the reverse question. Um, well, first of all, what are your goals? But on the other end of the what are your goals is the question of if based on what's around you, you ended up being kind of a first off the bench or whatever, all the way through, how, how would you respond to that? You know, it's interesting to know uh, there are certain athletes who are, well, I wouldn't necessarily want that role, but if that's the role I'm assigned, I'm going to work my butt off uh, to do it as well as I can and try to expand it. Um, but, you know, there's different, uh, different responses from different athletes to that question. It's an uncomfortable kind of question. That's a really hard, like, I think it's a really hard thing for the athletes to know because they've always been likely if they're playing at a top program, you know, they've never come off the bench unless it's on like a national team program, you know, so they have no, they have no experience in that regard. And so I think there's sometimes a little bit of a education. Sometimes it's a bit of a dance around those kind of, you know, areas. I really encourage them to reach out to as they're getting more info, you know, to even former players, like players that aren't even on our program anymore, if they need, or athletes, like I don't coach our athletes, because I, I really think for them to make good decision, they need, you know, if they're going to two, three, four different coaches and hearing similar things, hopefully that's educating them on what the transition and the jump will be will be like and I think that's what's behind I was saying earlier on some of the challenges some individuals have had and I don't blame them necessarily you know necessarily it's it's just all of a sudden it can be a straight volleyball factor that you know let's pick serve receiver and outside hitter we've only been able to see them play on little narrow sport courts where you're not even don't even have two meters to serve and serve receive is a completely different skill in a big gym where the ball's coming a lot harder. So how can, you know, don't really know yet how they're going to develop, you know, over that time period. So again, I'll pivot back like to the comments on that's a bit the, you know, trying to get a sense of the maturity and the character that's behind it. Are they going to be able to have a little resilience as they work through that for maybe two two years, right? And the time frame that most high school and club athletes have looking at is they want to know what club they're playing for right now and how does that do? And it does not extend beyond that. So you start talking to a 17, 18 year old about five year windows and their eyes are going to glaze over, but that's actually what we're worried about. Right? So, um, I Colin, you spent time preparing questions and I started and they kind of ignored it. So yeah, well, what do we actually... Old. Hey, I just want to jump into one thing because I, I, I just want to piggyback off of what Doug said last time too because you talk about a talent level that way of the serve-receiving stuff. But I also get the, uh, the comments in the recruiting letters about um, uh, I'm an excellent leader. 
I've got excellent leadership skills and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, I often, you know, I, I've only done it on a couple of occasions, but I actually turned a question on the young man saying, well, you think you're going to come into our gym in your first year and lead us? Do you, do, we have a team full of MVPs who are the most valuable players on their team, student athletes of the year at their schools, you know, provincial team, youth national team, and you think you're actually, or are you going to be able to come in and follow for a little bit? Are you actually mm. just going to help our team mm. or mm. you need that leadership? Because, you know, you, you got to understand what you're walking into as well. And I, I understand you got great leadership skills, but that doesn't always equate to the situation you're walking into when the first couple of years you might have to earn it. And, um, and I don't think sometimes you, it doesn't happen or doesn't stop having to earn it after your first couple of years. So it, just, I just want them to be aware that really what they're, if we're doing our homework to that level, they should too. Yeah. So t they got to emphasize that they're a team player and they're willing to take on roles and be adaptable. So that you're looking more for that. And that's sort of getting what I was looking for since Doug just uh, avoided the question, but I'm looking for those types of things. Like those are the things you're going to look for those characteristics, those character traits, um, in an athlete. Now, my question is, how do you do that from a video? How do you like, wow. we're always telling our athletes, Hey, if you think no one's watching you right now, when you're sitting on the bench, people are watching you right now. Is that true? Absolutely. And uh, I'm, I'm going to let, let uh, a couple trade secrets out today and uh, yeah. could end up biting me in the butt. But the reality of it is um, I really like going to multi-court tournaments. Uh, Nationals is a perfect op uh, opportunity our provincial championships here in Ontario are, are a great opportunity that way too, where there's multi courts. And um, oftentimes I'll watch a match from two courts over because um, I don't necessarily want them to know that I'm watching it. And so I'll see the young man toss his water bottle to his mom to go fill it up and not say please or thank you. Um, those are flags for me. Uh, I, I want, I want, um, I want character. I don't have to, I want, I don't want to have to worry about these young men when they're coming into our gym. So I want them to operate with integrity and respect and, 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 and pursue excellence. Um, so I often watch matches from two courts over uh, so that I can see the way somebody reacts. Um, I think the first 15 minutes in the gym, everybody understands who the most talented people are. Um, but I think that's one reason why it's really difficult to recruit cross country as well is because it's really hard to assess character through a highlight film. You know, I heard another coaching cliche that says nobody ever misses a shot on a highlight tape. So you, you, you got to watch game film. You got to see how they, how they react in those points that are, are good and bad and, and how they react to teammates who make good and bad plays and how they react to coaches and timeouts. And those are a lot of the things that, and, and sometimes you can't do that in a tournament call. And so it takes, two, three, five, 15 times to see these people over a period of time to evaluate that character. I can't go into a gym and I can see the talent, but I can't evaluate the character once. So it takes a little bit of time, but they call it work for a reason. And you're going to do it on the front end or you're going to do it on the back end if you get the wrong people in your gym. Thanks. Doug, you got anything to add? Yeah, I'm going to go actually back to your question because I covered a little bit of it and I'm going to just talk for the coaches for a little bit on just the things, uh, you know, I think a number of university coaches look for, at least on the women's, the women's side. And so it's and a little bit beyond that blue, if you go just below that blue chip athlete to the ones that have expressed interest and are close, that's a bigger group. Ones that could do it at, in our, in our conference or at the national level and like so that we are that group is bigger and that's where we spend the most time trying to figure it out who is the best person or two people let's say that we are looking to recruit or to keep going and so some of it's going to be skill level and you're going to factor that in but that's just it you're to me i'm also looking very much and it'll depend a little bit positionally but you want that overall athleticism the ability to move and they just you know kind of look athletic 
And I think it's important for coaches to know that partly you're going to have athletes that maybe I'm not going to say, I mean, they, they may have worked their butts off for years and they're in grade 11 and they have maybe plateaued a little bit, right? And it could be a little bit harder for them. And they may not understand why a different athlete was selected because we think that come third year university, this individual will pass them as just an overall athlete. So the eye work that I'm trying to do when I'm watching this athlete is in at that national championships, let's say, is going, okay, with training, how would this person do? And where are the biggest gaps here? So for middle blockers, sudden instead, their, their blocking movement and their position stuff is going to become a lot more complex and difficult. The offense is going faster. There's more hitters that are attacking the ball. So they have to be good. So we're looking at some base stuff there and making sure there isn't some real, I would say, habits that are going to be really tough to break. Let's take a couple of other key things. I've talked a little bit about ball handling, ball control at a higher level. Even that can be hard to assess in their environment. But then we're looking who can be attacking the ball at a high enough level, potentially have enough velocity so that, again, with training could get better. So some of those I think you guys know. So who's going to hit hard? Who's going to move well? All those things are factors without question. And then we're going to dial in a little bit more to some of the other aspects that Dave talked about. And it can be really challenging because a lot of times I'm, I, don't, I don't get to see them, uh, you know, multiple, multiple times. So I'm going to have to rely on other, other avenues to assess that I think we can probably dive into a little bit, you know, dive into a little bit more. But, you know, Dave's examples I think are very valuable and I think a lot of coaches want to do that. So if we're looking at somebody, we're going to want to see them both when things are going okay and especially when things aren't going very well for their team or for them individually. That's the piece I'm really going to look at. I'm going to also look and go increasingly, if they make an error, how do they react and where do they look? Are they always looking at the coach as an example? To me, that's a bit of a red flag. But then I assess, is that the culture of that club team or, you know, like that could be just the way that group goes. So now I've got to dial in a little bit longer and go, is everybody doing that? And maybe that's the coach's issue, not the player's issue. Okay. So just sometimes you spend as much time watching in between plays as you do the actual play or I'll watch their reaction from blocking if they didn't make the right read or the right movement and how do they handle that. So, um, you know, I, I think our challenge as university coaches in a short period of time is to narrow it down as much as possible who we're going to look at in those environments so we can have a more complete look. So increasingly on our side, I'll bring three to four. We'll be, our whole coaching staff will go to national championships. So we've got four people looking at them, not just, let's say myself as well, to get more looks, you know, and more time and more opinions. Is, with uh, Just thinking on that one, like, do you guys have, I, I'm picturing, uh, you know, some type of uh, psychological testing characteristic traits you have written on paper and you're marking them out, or is it just simply just taking notes on your own? And then the other one was, I'm thinking, if I'm a, if I'm a player and I want to show you what type of athlete I am, I, I might be better off to send you video of me, me in practice, send you a practice tape there versus a game tape. Um, in terms of, again, not a highlight practice, but something where I can show you, you know, I can edit out the warm up, but maybe I want to show you the warm up. I want to show you what my dedication is. Um, as an athlete, do you get many of those? And would you think an athlete, would that benefit an athlete if they showed you that they want to show you what their work ethic is like by sending you uh, practice tapes? I'll leave it for both of you guys. Yeah, it doesn't. Doesn't happen that often, but I did get one just yesterday as a matter of fact, like shorter 
you know, five minutes, but in part, I think because nobody, you know, we can talk COVID, pre-COVID recruiting and post-COVID or during COVID recruiting, and those are different beasts, you know, so that's part of it. So um, um, to be honest, it the highlight tape gives you a feel. Additional video, we will reach out and go, do you have some game tape? You know, do you have, or practice tape if it's done, like if it's, you know, like literally you could, I think it's a great idea, Colin, because you could get, let's say you're looking at that middle blocker example, and you just set up a drill that's live. So the, the, the ones that are useless to me are ones where it's like the coach is tossing a ball, basically. So after one rep of that, I've seen enough. I don't need to see 33 reps of that, but I could see 33 reps of a virus type drill where there's a live passer, live setter with wing hitters, let's say, and I'm watching that middle blocker make decisions and move. Right. And especially if I can see their, see their eye work at the same time, um, you know, in zoom land, now what we've been doing with some of our recruits is we actually went through some of their video with them here's what we see and here's what we think you got to get better at if you want to think the next level and you know that's been that's been interesting don't inundate me with that because it actually takes a long time to prep and to do but um you know that kind of piece I think could be really helpful and might be one that even for club coaches, you know, I wouldn't even mind, I'd have no problem with the club coach joining that kind of, you know, discussion too. So I think, yeah, more time in practice would be good. Yeah. I think it's, uh, you know, just on top of my head, it just starts causing, I mean, what I think it would benefit the whole team itself if they start videotaping practice, because now they got to look at practice and, and look at that and see where the process is, is occurring versus just looking at game film. <clears throat> just to jump in practice. jump in real quick like there's times you're going to watch a match or video and there's a poor middle blocker and the passing isn't good enough and you never get to see him actually attack the ball yeah. or they're playing a team that they're winning easily and you never actually see the other team in system so i can't actually assess their abilities as a middle blocker yeah for sure yeah i i can see yeah it's just more and more i think about it the more i more and more i would say <clears throat> I, I would probably more prefer to see more of that type of gameplay action in practice because you're going to get way more opportunities to see things happening at live speed. So also, quicker. Colin, I think we're pretty lucky in Ontario with the HPC. Uh, for me, I, that, that was a huge way of evaluating character. I went every single year uh, while I was still actively coaching because that's a six or seven, now it's up to like nine days where you get to see them interact on and off the court. You get to coach them and see if they're coachable and how they respond, how they make changes. The competition element is there. So for me, that's like a mini season in a week and a really great opportunity to, um, to scratch kids off the list. You know, you're not, I'm not there to like actually recruit, but it's a great opportunity to go, I don't have any use for that kid. Like that's just a, a very self-centered kid, that type of thing. So um, that's one way that I would evaluate character. Right. Dave, anything to add? No, just, uh, you know, I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but that's what happens around kitchen tables, right? So um, for, for me, uh, you know, getting back to Doug's point, uh, fundamentals are always the most important. So serving and passing is one of the things we're always trying to add to our program. Um, some of, you know, filling in the gaps, but, uh, you know, it, it, ball control and serving is, is always the most important thing. So uh, when, when I'm talking with our staff about recruiting or talking about club coaches, I'll say, give me a list of the top five servers in the province or wherever we're at. And then we go take a look and, and, and really kind of evaluate that. And, or the, who are the five best passers? Uh, who are the five best high ball hitters? Um, and then, how many of those actually fit into our into our realm? So, um, you know, as Doug mentioned, footwork for middles is huge. Hi, Kenny Cron. Speaking of one of the best middles ever. Um, uh, a little you know, undersized. Yeah. Well, and we, he made me. He made up for that. Um, <laughs> middles, married what? Well, married well though. He married a Westman alumni. <laughs> um, footwork for middles. High ball management or, or uh, you know, termination hitting from an opposite, uh, reception from an outside hitter, 
serving, uh, you know, and then obviously we get into setter specific stuff, but uh, there's no doubt we always look for that stuff. And then it starts to escalate to the next level of, okay, now how do they fit in their gym? And just before you, just, just a sec, just before you go to that, cause I, I, I want to know, cause I'm a big growth mindset guy. When you're looking at, um, past their receivers, are you looking at technique or are you looking at results? Are you looking at both or are you more saying, hey, they, they've got the technique, the results not quite there, but with more repetition, they're going to get there. And as Doug said, three to five years, I can see them being able to handle that serve from the entire, uh, from a big gym scenario versus what we are now. Because there's some guys that can pass just simply because they found the way to do it. But Absolutely. I coached one of the best ones ever uh, with Andrew Richards. Uh, he passes like a tennis player because he grew up being a tennis player. So everything was short levers to his sides and, and he passed it like he was swinging a tennis racket because that's what he did. Uh, no, there wasn't one second of my work with him where I thought about changing that. He was brilliant at what he was doing. I didn't want to change that. Would I teach that in a camp? Absolutely not, but he did it. So uh, I think it's a, you know, we talk about fit and, and, and that's, you know, the one thing I've learned in almost as coaching as long as Doug is that there's never one way to do anything. Right. Um, and just because somebody does it some way, doesn't necessarily mean that everybody has to do it that way. So consistency uh, so, the way they do it, right? It's, it's absolutely. Easy. Now there, yeah, there are some standards and there's some principles, uh, you know, the footwork and the body posture and a whole bunch of different stuff. Uh, but you know, um, I'm, I, if, if I don't need to fix it, I guess the question is going to be how far will that go? At what point will that break it down? All right. So if Andrew's passing in here, how big of a seam is he going to be able to take? Because it's always in here. All right. So there's always limits to whatever we do. Um, and it's my job to kind of help figure some of that stuff out. But I know that there's never one way to do anything. So, uh, you know, I'm looking for a little bit of result column, but I'm also looking for, you know what, that tap, that, technique looks really good maybe they're just not getting the results yet right. maybe they need a couple three thousand more reps on that and and we can provide that over a course of five years um so there, there those are the gaps that i think doug was talking about earlier about forecasting a little bit and maybe they're not the best passer in the gym right now but do they have the capacity to be in two years right. um and and those are you know that's the art of it we talked about the science of it now it's the art of it. And do we, are we going to be able to have enough reps to get that person to where they are by the time they leave? Or am I going to run out of eligibility? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's important. It's important for athletes to recognize, too, is that the, the university coach doesn't scratch you off their list because you didn't pass four threes in a row. Absolutely. It, they're not right. looking at they're, – they're looking at that, but they're more looking at the technique. Was the technique the same of all four of those passes? Then we know yeah. we've got some consistency in motor – coordination down now we can work on results after that <clears throat> and perhaps Colin your reaction to when you didn't pass those four in a row that you probably thought you right. did or you right. should have how did you handle that all right so right. yeah maybe you should have but you didn't and how did so what was your response to that that shows a little bit of coachability even though I haven't had you in my gym yet right you were sorry and I cut you off were you gonna you're gonna add something you forgot of that but me yep no, man, I'm good. I'm just waiting for Doug to say something else that I can learn from. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, how, much, how much do you guys spend talking to their coach in terms of that char those character traits? Not necessarily the technique maybe so much, but uh, I know the conversation I had this year, some of it was about, you know, where do you see the coach, where do you see this athlete in two to three years? Can they handle the next level? And that type of question. Do you guys do that? I guess it depends on who the coach is, but um, how much and what do you talk to coaches about? You hey, waiting on me, Doug? I'm not pointing at you. You're that uh, way. One of you guys, go um, ahead. Yeah, I, I do. I try to as much as I can, Colin. Uh, some of them I don't know, so I have to, you know, introduce myself, and they may not know me, so I got to talk to them and 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 establish a relationship with those coaches. Um, and if I don't know that coach, because I know a lot of coaches are just advocating right now, right? They, they, they're, they're, they're selling athletes. They, they want to, they're promoting athletes. Um, so you may not get always get the, um, uh, the most accurate answer, 
um, or more sometimes they tell you what you want to hear. But I think having been in the league for enough time, for enough years now, I got a network of people who I do trust. And I'd say, hey, there's a young person in your area. And what can you tell me about them? And although it's their perspective and they may not have been in the, in the same gym, they're usually pretty accurate about what it's like. Right. Because uh, so uh, thankfully, we do have a, a pretty good network across the country and we can kind of tap into some of that stuff. But I think those conversations are, are really good. I also try if I can connect the parents, you, you know, I, I always do what every other coach does. You watch the kid walk off the court and see where they're walking to mom and dad. And then we got to isolate who mom and dad are. And then we can try and talk to them later on. Or, you know, if, you, if we don't have the formal introduction, all the all the spy techniques that coaches use. Um, but we, you know, we have to, uh, we have to, uh, try and amass as much information, especially when we're not as familiar with them, either they're coming from across the country or they're, you know, they're just starting to work the way onto the list. And that list Colin is getting younger and younger every year, right? Like grade tens. Uh, I got, I, when I started coaching 28 years ago, I never talked to a grade 10. Um, and, and the problem with grade tens in Canada right now is, they're even playing on a lower height net. So they're not even playing on a men's height net. They're playing a completely different game. So serving and passing, everything changes at that stage. So, but that's the way recruiting is going right now. And so I'm talking to, I haven't talked to a grade eight yet. I haven't yet, Doug. Uh, so you're, uh, you're ahead of me there. But uh, I haven't. I, have, I've I had just didn't nine. answer the email. Yeah, I've had grade nines and, uh, and you, know, the, you know, the odd grade 10. Uh, but, you know, there's, you know, there's obviously exceptions that, you know, the great tens that are playing up and all that other kind of stuff. But um, I, got, I got an email the other day from a young man who's coming in 2025. Come on, man. So I haven't answered that one yet. So I'll get back to him in a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I, I'm going to wrap up this sort of this questioning line. Um, well, two things. One I want to know is, can you sort of explain when you say, uh, you talk, Dave, you talk about scholarship money and you don't have a lot. What can you give us sort of a general idea to the athletes and coaches? What can they expect in terms of being offered stuff um, in terms of sort of generalities? Well, um, I, you know, I, 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 again, I think that's um, every program has their own, set of resources that they can provide. Uh, we try and provide uh, good development opportunities. Um, so if you come in and coming into our gym, we're going to try and make you better. Um, I think everybody has that. I don't think that separates us. Uh, we try and have at least two good non-conference competitions to enhance our, our, our league structure every year. Uh, so whether we go to Europe or whether we go to California or we bring those teams in, we try and make our non-conference schedule as difficult as possible so that we get really good opportunities to, uh, to compete there. Um, and then I, I, you know, that the other thing I say uh, a lot in our recruiting um, process is that if we can't give you money, we'll spend money on you. Right. So um, that's in terms of program enhancements um, like um, uh, shoes, um, travel gear, um, um, you know, uh, catered meals on the road, that type of stuff. Uh, so there, there's certain program enhancements that we can help with um, that go over and above what our scholarship money is. Obviously, like every other school, there's bursaries and, and other things that are available. I don't think that separates us. So we just try and find the, the things that we can add value uh, to invest in that student athlete's development. Good. Doug? You guys, and, and um, I guess maybe also, for Doug, you, and we'll come back to Dave on this. So just the rules around uh, uh, out west versus OUA, like what type of restrictions do you guys have to follow? Yeah, well, I'll just give you ours. So we're allowed to provide financial support up to tuition and some of the fees. Okay, so that's that's the athletic scholarship portion, portion that's allowed within U-sport regulations. So not every one of our athletes is going to get all of that. We don't have a big enough scholarship budget right now to do that. And I try and actually keep the range that I provide to the athletes very narrow 
by and large, so that there isn't a big gap. And that funnels back to the earlier comments just about the uncertainty of where it's going. I make basically same guarantee this amount will not go down in the four or five years you're with the program. It will only go up. And that's going to be based on our fundraising ability. You know, that's going to be based on what that budget is and how, you know, I'm going to try and raise this, especially if tuition uh, increases. So um, I then have frank discussions with the parents just about this is what it looks like. Grade 12 is the toughest year um, because they don't really have much time. So after that, depending on the athlete, you know, most of them, if they're going back home, like I don't demand that athletes stay, let's say if they're not, they were coming from Ontario as an example, they can go back home. They can be working through that time, especially if they're not playing, playing volleyball. Similar to Dave. So, you know, because we can't offer everything, we don't spend a lot of time <laughs> talking about the financial side of things. Cause if they're comparing, let's say to an NCA offer or their places, we can't offer as much. So what I'm trying to sensitize the athlete, but also the family to is, is this the best overall decision for you? So academically, what do you want to achieve and where do you want to be at the end of that inability to what you want to, I don't expect, I don't even want answers about career, but in school that might lead you by and large. Now you need some posted graduate education for a lot of, for most professions. So that would be another change, you know, for maybe 25, 30 years ago, possibly at UBC, we're attracting along and strong academic students. So it's like, okay, I want to do this. And this is why they're coming with that. So we're answering that and we're talking about our ability as a program to support them as students and as athletes. So that's going to be very important in terms of what, what we, in terms of what we do. Um, we're going to talk about if you're moving from like an Ontario, are you going to, is this going to work for you? Like, do you think you can actually do that? Because I'll say, this goes up and down, but we've had a number of athletes and Terry's you know, a lot of very good uh, female players, but a number of them this year, for example, that we were recruiting chose to stay close to home. They didn't, you know, they didn't want to either leave the province or move too far away. So we're trying to get a sense around that. Are you going to be happy? And sometimes the way I phrase it is heaven forbid somebody gets hurt, right? You're hurt and you're not capable of playing for a year. Will you be happy attending school and rehabbing in this city at this university, taking this academic program? And so I try and get them to have a little pause around that, you know, just to make sure they're considering, considering where I am because I'm, you know, in Canada, I kind of like system, like we are students and athletes. You're going to do both here. And I make zero apologies for that. If they're comparing that, well, this is what I'm going to get at the university of wherever down South. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be different. Um, so you're, you're choosing, you know, it's not a direct comparison. And, um, but I, you know, we can get into that discussion probably in a longer, that a longer thing, but that's kind of the approach. Let's look at those top four to five things that are really important. Probably the one I didn't mention is where we'll go through the roster. I encourage them to go through the roster and take a look at it and where they could see themselves being and asking any questions to us around that. Okay. So this won't occur until after they've had a campus visit, right? Till they've seen the school, till our players have met and talked with them, you know, they met the coaching staff. So that's at that kind of level. I got to pause for just those, one second. Those, are those visits uh, paid for or do they pay for that themselves? Most of the time they're paid for because we narrow down. Okay. And, and uh, Dave, what about you? Um, well, currently, according to OUA regulations, we're allowed to give up to $4,500 a year, um, which um, is is uh, perceived to be less than uh, the rest of the country. But the reality of it is, based on a tuition at our school specifically, if a student athlete reduced their course load 
to take a four year degree over five years, which a lot of them do, it actually covers their tuition. So it's around the same. Uh, it's not that far off. Um, so I, I know a lot of times uh, the term tuition and fees gets uh, comparative to the uh, cap at in Ontario at 4,500, but the actual value number is, uh, is not that far off from each other. Um, so um, the, the fees part is a little different because the 4,500 gets capped. But uh, yeah, I would say, you know, the process that, that Doug described is exactly what we're looking at. Um, the only thing I would suggest is that on the men's side, um, the draw down south isn't as big as it, it is on the women's side. It's getting to be as much. Um, uh, but I do think that they're very different leagues and Canada offers a very different product. Uh, it's very much a developmental league. We're not restricted to the number of hours we can train our athletes. We're not restricted to the number of competitions we can have. Um, you know, we, we, there, there's a lot more to the student athlete development side on north of the border. So, um, uh, you know, I think, you know, everybody makes decisions for their own reasons. There's no doubt about that. But the reality of it is um, the Canadian men's development side. And I think the comparatives to the top five, 10 teams in the U S and the top five, 10 teams in Canada on the men's side is a, is a statement to that. Um, you know, so uh, I, I think those two leagues kind of equate themselves a little bit different. Now, we're still in the last three or four, probably five years, we still have lost some of the blue chips down south. Um, but prior to that, it was pretty good. Uh, we, we kept quite a few of them here. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll continue to, to fight that battle. Uh, but, uh, you know, in terms of the Canadian uh, side of things, um, I think there's a lot of really good programs out there offering a lot of really good resources. And uh, I think it's a statement that our men's national team is doing as well as they are right now with that many U sports, CIA, U and CIS products. So. Sure. And I think families also have to factor in the cost of flights. Dave's absolutely right. 4,500 does turn out comparable, especially when you add the flight to get out there in the fall, home at Christmas, back out in January and so on. You're probably adding close to two grand in many cases. So, Right. And, and Doug, I got a question. Uh, because we're talking with the NCAA, why, why do we not have see more, or I guess maybe because it's the season, women's uh, teams playing the, the NCAA teams like we do with the men's? To me, that... I don't know. Um, I, I would strict, think recruiting, recruiting wise, it makes it when we see that our men, our our U, uh, U sport teams are beating or competing one, you know, pretty you know five set matches. I, as an athlete, I'm going, well, why would I go down there? Other than you know the the thrill of going down there or playing in California, which I could see the attraction of that. But uh, other than that, I, I I see us. Well, I'm I'm going to get just as good as volleyball up here, whereas I think some females perceive that the volleyball in the States is better so that they, that, that might be a drawing point right now. Is there, is that true? I guess is number one. And number two, why do we not compete with them? Well, we, to start with that one, we don't compete with them because of the schedules, right? Like their yeah. competitive schedules. So they start, um, like if they were playing this year, they would have started training on August the 8th. Right. And they can only train and they have very limited, and now if they're in a bigger conference, they've only got a few matches that they can, extra matches they can play. And those extra matches have to occur on the same day. So that's why you see them playing two to three tournaments and they'll play, a lot of the teams will play twice in a day just to get the volume of matches. So for a lot of NCA coaches, they need to, and they are carefully structuring that competitive thing. So for a lot, the top handful of schools don't give a rip, right? Stanford doesn't care. Nebraska doesn't care. They just want good matches in front of lots of people, right? But if you dip below, to, I don't know, 25, 30, I'm just making that up, but there's 300 programs, right? The, uh, to me, it's crazy, but one of the primary thing that lets you keep your job as an NCAA coach, at least in women's volleyball, is to get to 20 wins. So they're going to look and go, where do I fit in a conference schedule? And I'm going to win about 15, 16 here. And then I'm going to get a few more here in these non-conference. And when they play a Canadian school, because those matches do not count. Okay. 
Okay. So they're not counting in their competitive record. So very few schools, some of the top schools wouldn't mind, but they don't, why would they play us if they can play, you know, if they can play in front of Nebraska in front of, you know, 15,000 people, they're going to choose that. Like what's a better draw for their program? Like in their kids, what Dave talked about. Right. And so, you know, I'll give you an example. Like we were on California a fair bit and they'll say, they'll say, do you want to play? Like I'll go Pepperdine, like Pepperdine willing to play us, but can you come a week earlier? And I'm like, no, I can't drive my kids like get them back here on August the 24th, you know, with no practices to play you. That's not in, that's not good for our program. And then we've had other ones, other times where we, let's say the fourth team in a tournament, the weakest of the four teams has just said, no, we don't want to do that. Like they'll have looked a couple of, you know, years out because they need a weak team that they can count in their win record. So that's one of the things. So scheduling just doesn't work and we don't help them that much. So there's times we get some, you know, some, some matches that way, but that's the basic reason. Um, and the other part of yours is, is the level different? Like the men's volleyball level is, is closer Canada, the U S than the top programs. So I'll just be honest, like the level that if you're watching like the elite eight in women's volleyball, it's just my opinion, like physically, we don't have enough players that can compete at that level. Right. So um, top U sport teams could, you know, win matches probably in every conference, you know, depending on the year, but we'd be top couple of conferences. We'd be finishing near closer to the bottom. So you know, they're just too big, too physical. Is that just because they have so much more uh, av athletes available to them? That their pool is way more bigger, so they're able to house them with more <clears throat> bigger programs? And scholarship money can recruit international athletes. So totally. not only do they have 10 times the population we do, they also have 10 times the recruiting budget to recruit the international athletes on top of the 10 times that they have. So... Um, yeah, and, and when you start to talk about economies of scale, it starts to tip pretty quick. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the best program, they will go wherever, whatever to, you know, they'll get, they don't have a P1. They're going to find a P1 somewhere. A good friend of mine coaches in NCAA women, one of the top schools in the country. And uh, he instructed his assistant, go find me the best middle player you can in the world. And he did. And his assistant went to Europe and everywhere else to go find the best middle player that he could find in the world. So uh, th that conversation didn't have a lot of parallels to my reality. <laughs> yeah. 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 Money talks. Yeah. Uh, all right. I want to finish this section off with one question. Uh, and then Doug, you, the way I'm going to phrase this, you're going to have to take out the Ottawa U part that I'm going to put in just so Lionel doesn't get upset. Um, if you had to, you have to take off your 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 jacket now, and you're no longer coaching uh, your successful programs. Now you're going to start a program right from scratch. So you're going to Ottawa U, and you're now going to step in there. What would be what would be in terms of recruiting your athletes? What's your what's your thought process? What are you looking for, and what are you going to do? So you're so that they already have a program, is what you're saying? No, no, I'm but saying no. So you're coming they have Ottawa no U. No, there's no men's program at all to you other than a club team. Okay. Uh, so, men, so the yeah, so we're gonna do men. Or Carlton, Carlton, who yeah, cut their women's Carlton program women's off. Women's team. There you go. How's that? How's yeah, that? That's okay. Good. Yeah. Um, so the first thing, you know, actually would be kind of exciting because remember when I said that we don't have, there's not that many blue chip athletes out there, but with the growth of club and you know, especially in Ontario, like how strong club volleyball has become in Ontario there is a whole lot of players that are pretty that that probably could do it you know so i would be doing my darndest to get the word out that you know do you want to challenge you want to come in and uh complain you know compete compete right away and so i would be doing um what i probably don't do way more like a open id camp and go big because 
and that's a big contrast. If you're only looking to fill one or two spots, you're just creating more work for yourself and false expectations for athletes by, in my opinion, by going really big in terms of your identification things. So I would flip that around and I would, it would be a bit who actually still come down to academics because they're still going to be there for, you know, you want them to be there for four or five years. So they have to do well and they've got to, you know, want to be in that educational institution and should be there for those reasons. So we have that, you know, that would be part of the, part of the process. But I actually think you would find, I actually, if a new program started in a fairly good academic institution, I don't think it would actually take them that long to be competitive. I'm not saying they're going to win, but they could be competitive pretty quickly. They might get one or two transfer players. They'd, um, there's fewer CCAA, but a CCAA athlete would now go, huh, I played two or three years, let's say somewhere. So instead of going to a stronger program and maybe sitting in another transition year, I could be, I really could be, you know, I've got more experience. So I, w- I would look at both of those, those routes and who wanted, who wanted to do it. Is that kind of along the lines of what you were yeah. looking for? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Where would you go get your athletes and how would you get your athletes? That's perfect. Yep. I could see that. Hey, what about you on the guy side? Since that's the one that's more realistic for this program in theory, hopefully. Um, I think it's a, I think anytime you're starting a program like that from scratch, I think you got to look at all your resources. First, I think you got to look at your physical resources. What, what, what physical resources do you have in the gym that you're going to be able to make sure that those kids understand that you're going to be able to make them better? Um, that what, what are you going to do there? Um, so is that filming your practices? Is it your scouting for, you know, uh, your, your data volley? What, what, what are you doing to help make them better? So, what physical resources can you put in place? Um, what financial resources do you have to assist with them? Um, and then you can look at your human resources. Uh, who, who am I going to be working with? Who are they going to be working with? And, you know, what can I get? Um, and uh, I, I, I don't think just because it's a new program that you'd have to settle much. I agree with Doug. I think it wouldn't take very long to be competitive. Um, uh, I think you'd have to really make sure that you define that, but I think you got to look at your physical. I think you got to look at your financial and I think you got to look at your human resources when you're building that infrastructure and you get the best value for your money in all areas of that. Um, and I think that, uh, if, if you can do that, um, then I think it, it, uh, you, you'd probably, uh, change the slope of that success curve pretty quickly. Brenda, you want to add anything? Oh, I, I think these guys are good. good. All right, I'll keep that in mind. Let whoever takes over that program know that. <laughs> this is the end of part one. Thanks for watching. Click in the top left hand corner for part two. Be sure to subscribe and like the video if you enjoyed it.